right now. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Let's try that. Okay. Hey, we're back. Hey, hey, hey. I don't know if we ever left. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we did. <laughs> Very good cursing going on there. No way. <laughs> it looks like we're up and running now. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're a little bit late, but uh, we apologize for that. But that's technical glitches, and that's what happens when you go live. Sometimes. Not always, but maybe we should record the show from now on. <laughs> Wouldn't be a bad idea, I think, sometimes. It's mostly me, but... Um, oh, we're here. That's the main thing. Through, so. hmm? We're here. That's the main thing. We're here. That's right. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for March the 26th, the Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! Uh, Yay! Yes, 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 right was, yes. <laughs> I'll have to go back and delete those old ones. <laughs> Okay, my name is Chris Burren. I'm your host uh, for this evening and the creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and the St. John Astronomy Club. Yay! Hey. A little solar flare activity. <laughs> that might have been the reason. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome back our two regular co-hosts for the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, uh, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moon Shadow Observatory here in beautiful uh, Hampton, NB. Well, there yeah. in beautiful Hampton. Hey, Paul. <laughs> Time for another drink of coffee. Yeah, me too. I think you need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I loves me coffee. And our other regular co-host uh, for this evening uh, here in the program, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Welcome, Mike. Hey. Two hands. <laughs> okay, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, uh, today's modern, modern astronomers have made significant discoveries, helping us understand the true nature of our universe, from their explorations of dark matter to their quest for determining the age of the universe, and like many of those in other professions, today's astronomers stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, today, we're going to pay tribute to a couple of them and how they helped influence uh, what we know about our universe today. Uh, also tonight, uh, Mike will be bringing back a vinyl bud for another fine binocular target of the week. Uh, Paul will be introducing another Rosanna's fun fact for us to enjoy. Really? Yes? Okay. Um, I'm going to have a quick look at what to watch for in the coming week, and we'll have all of your wonderful photos submissions to share. And also today, we're going to be checking in with uh, Stefan Picard of Cliff Valley Astronomer. Hey, Stefan. Hey, guys. Um, he's going to give us an update <laughs> on his ventures into astrotourism and uh, in the area, yeah. and also uh, his... Oh, uh, I'm hmm? oh, I'm sorry. I'm just... <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Also, they have bills for that. <laughs> his sky experience 2024. That we talk a lot about tonight. So. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this is a family friendly interactive live broadcast. So, for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions here in real time as well. Stefan's going to answer them because he's a new guy tonight. <laughs> <All adult. laughs> and of course, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support, everybody. Uh, so let's get started then with tonight's program and a look at some of our favorite giants in astronomy. Paul, you're going to take up the first. All right. I will, I will. I'm actually excited to talk about this gentleman. Um, this guy has done so much for astronomy. 
And uh, it's unbelievable. And that as I read more and more about this gentleman, um, it amazes me <clears throat> uh, how much he's done and how much we've seen him in his name, but not realized who he is and what he's done. So I thought it'd be fitting because last week when uh, Kurt did his thing, we actually talked about who had the longest running television show. And actually, the, the, the actual title is who hosted the longest running television show. And it was Sir Patrick Moore. And he did it for 55 years. Wow, unbelievable. 55 years. I, I, can you imagine? No. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to I'm going to show a couple of pictures of them just to kind of just have them up on screen. So instead of looking at us, you can look at who we're talking about. And then I'm just going to read some stuff from um, the Royal Society uh, publishing and all about Patrick Moore. And they have a whole bunch of different segments on them. I'm only going to read a few, but the ones I think that are important. And I told Chris earlier, I said, Chris, pay attention to this because you are going to see similarities in what Sir Patrick Moore did and what you're doing today. And uh, the more I read about it, the more I could see Chris Kerwin throughout this whole thing. So anyway, so this is this this is really quite a quite a story, and I'm I'm quite excited to talk about it. So let me just share my screen. Uh, that one there, and let me know if you see Mr. Moore on the screen. You do. Let's see Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you might be. <laughs> He's got to get a monocle. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this is Sir Patrick Alfred Caldwell Moore. He was born in March the 4th, 1923, and he passed away in 2012. Um, this guy has done so much. I'm just going to read you just a little <clears throat> something here that I found interesting. So here we go. Patrick Moore was the uh, art... Uh, yeah, the archetype of the English eccentric, bringing a passionate enthusiasm for astronomy to the general public, principally through his long running television series, The Sky at Night. He was inspired. He was an inspired amateur who made no pretense at being a professional, but who had the extraordinary ability to communicate in simple, articulate and direct language the significance of the advances in astronomy and astrophysics to the general public. He inspired generations of young people to take an interest in, astro in astronomy and in science in general. This passion was combined with a love of everything, English, especially cricket. He was a great cricket player and political views, which might have mildly described him as an extreme right wing. <laughs> but anyway, in his early life, uh, he actually um, was born on March the 4th, 1923. His um, father was uh, an accountant and he, who had served in the, in the First World War, and he got, he got numerous um, medals for doing so. And his mother, uh, Gertrude Lilliam, uh, she was from London. Uh, she was actually a wealthy London solicitor uh, and actually an, opera, an amateur opera singer which was kind of cool. Maybe that's where Patrick or uh, Brian May got his like for this guy. I don't know. But Patrick was baptized Patrick Alfred Moore. At some point in adulthood, he, he actually added the name Caldwell. And I'll explain a little bit further the significance of that. Initially as a middle name, later as part of a double barreled surname, and also began giving his father's name as Captain Charles Caldwell Moore. And Caldwell was actually his parental grandfather, William's middle name. So uh, Patrick was also an only child and a solitary one. And by the way, this guy never married. He stayed a bachelor his whole life. So I won't get into the war year stuff, but I do want to say that, and I didn't know this until I read this article, that Sir Patrick Moore did some of his um, military training in Moncton, New Brunswick. And that would kind of, it's like, wow, I can't believe that he was actually in Moncton, New Brunswick training. And when he was just a little fellow, young guy, when he when he joined his services, he tried a whole bunch of stuff, but he didn't have the health to do certain things. He wanted to be a, a pilot. So they had him go into navigation instead. And he did a whole bunch of different stuff uh, in his younger years. So um, <clears throat> let me just see now. Okay, let's get into the professional amateur astronomer. So after his father's death uh, in, in 1948, 
He taught history and French at Holmwood House Preparatory School near Tunbridge Wells when he was remembered as an enthusiastic teacher, but he left teaching in 1952. From the time onwards, he made a living as a freelance copy editor, author, and broadcaster, through briefly, though briefly serving as his, the first director of the uh, Arma Planetarium. Living in the elegant Georgian house nearby with his mother, he oversaw and the planning and construction of the planetarium, which took three years. And it was, I think it was finished in 68, but left that the day it was open to the public. The reasons for the abrupt departure aren't altogether clear, but there were cited that there were some religious things that were going on. So anyway, so he left for that reason. So Moore started that, uh, he, or Moore stated rather, that he had written over 100 books. And while we've got his picture up, I don't know if I can sift through some of them. I'm gonna show you some of them. This is just a couple. And these ones he actually was quite well known for, The Guide of the Moon, Patrick Moore uh, was, a, uh, you could call him a professional moon uh, chart fellow, and a lot of people used his work to study uh, the moon. He, anyway, that's one of his books. Uh, the other one that I will highlight is Patrick Moore on the moon. <laughs> Clear? <laughs> And all of these books, by the way, you can get on Amazon, and he's got well over 100 of them. The Sky at Night, uh, which was a, this, this is actually the stories about astronomy based on recent episodes of the longest running TV show in history. So that's actually a really, really interesting read. And the magazine that you guys may see called uh, um, The Sky at Night uh, came, comes from over there, too. Oh, and this one here is probably his most famous, The Photographic Atlas of the Stars. And uh, a lot of these books have been redone many times, but never rewritten. The way that he wrote them, because he was so articulate as a writer, they never had to be rewritten. Only if it was a long, 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 long time ahead and they were going to do a rewrite and there was something a little bit more interesting that had to go in. Other than that, nothing was ever changed or corrected. I'll go back to his photograph. This thing on here now. Oops, which way is the sign? Oh, there it is. Okay, let's go back to Patrick. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, uh, okay, yeah, so uh, this, this entirely plausible, this is entirely plausible, the 100 books that he claimed, uh, from the list of titles given in the, in the uh, bibliography, uh, and recalling that from 1962, he edited the Yearbook of Astronomy, published annually, uh, indeed, his biography, Martin, his biographer, sorry, Martin Mobberly counted 300 books, included revised editions and a yearbook. He scored an early, she scored an early success in 1953 with A Guide to the Moon, which was followed by A Guide to the Planets, A Guide to the Stars. Other representative titles included The Picture History of Astronomy, Astronomy Quiz Book, Armchair Astronomy, Explorers of Science. I'm just naming these because these are the relevant ones. And the Guinness Book, the Guinness Book of Astronomy. And his most commercially successful book was The Atlas of the Universe, which went through several editions and was translated into many languages. But, but the prolificity of, of book production, in addition to numerous newspapers and magazine articles, can be attributed to his extreme fluency in the use of the English language. And he told one of us from MSL that he never revised any of his writings. So that's, I mean, with all those books, that's unbelievable. So most of his books were aimed at children and the general reader, uh, but he developed a particular ex expertise of the moon and collabor uh, co collaborated with amateur astronomer Hugh Percy Wilkins on refining the latter's map of the, loon the lunar surface for republication in 1955. In the moon, a, uh, a complete description of the surface of the moon, the 300 inch diameter map was used by NASA to shortlist possible Apollo landing sites. And in 1995, he published a Caldwell catalog. That's the name Caldwell. That's where the name came from in the magazine, in the short, uh, in the magazine Sky and Telescope, a list of 109 of the brightest deep sky objects such as star clusters, nebula, and galaxies, which had been left out of the famous Messier catalog, compiled by, of course, Charles Messier. 
1771. So the Caldwell list of uh, the catalog came from this gentleman. Unbelievable. He also wrote several science fiction uh, stories for children, including five novels set on Mars featuring an orphaned 16-year-old Morris Gray and another six featuring the young astronaut Scott Saunders. And he published two humorous works under the name R.T. Fishall, Eurocrats, How to Annoy Them, <laughs> and The Twit Marsh File. Uh, the former contained the suggestions such as demanding replies to letters that had not been sent on rubbing candle wax on areas of forms of which said, do not write here. <laughs> he was a great lover of pranks and spoofs. Okay, so let's get into his broadcasting career. So Moore's first television appearance was in December 1956 uh, in a program on unidentified flying objects as part of BBC's firsthand series, in which he represented the skeptical, the skeptical position. So obviously he was the guys that we are today about certain things. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so despite the very late, oh, oh sorry, and it was launched in, uh, on April 24th, 1957, as an extremely low budget, around the midnight monthly half hour pre uh, program. So despite the very light billing, it was an enormous success. The opening cyberless music being um, immutably imprinted on many of our minds. You'd have to listen to the show to listen to the start to get what he's talking about there. Uh, for many years, it was filmed live, covering every conceivable topic in astronomy, as well as what was happening in the sky at the time each program was broadcast. He always made it completely clear, however, he was an amateur astronomer with no pretensions to professional expertise. He had the in, uh, inviolable ability of drawing the best out of his professional colleagues and making the topics perfectly accessible to the large non-expert audience. Sound familiar? Those of us who <laughs> appeared on the program remember with affection that the amateurish but compelling enthusiasm he brought out in even some of the trickiest aspects of astronomy. Perhaps the most amazing aspect of his role as anchor of the program was his outstanding ability to speak at an extremely high speed with complete fluency and immaculate articulation. So if you ever just watch him, just watch how fast he talks. And once you get into his groove, you can understand what he's saying. There was never a stumble. He told one of us that he always knew the end of the sentence when he started it. <laughs> That's amazing. So Moore presented the sky at night for more than 55 years, missing only one episode through ill health in 2004. He presented the subsequent episodes from his house. His last episode was broadcast on January the 7th, 2013, a month after his death, making it the longest running program with the same presenter in television history. Moore was sometimes, but not always, joined by guests among the most of the world's uh, leading astronomers and astronauts, but it was his, um, the ability, uh, uh, his ability, ability of television person, sorry, and rapid fire delivery, which held the program together and gave a verve and pace. The series drew large audiences and amateur astronomers and was credited by many younger professional and amateur astronomers and indeed scientists more generally with, with the first sparking of their interest in science. Now I'm going to show you one more picture. That's kind of cool. Chris, I think you can relate to this as well. This is for Patrick Moore, uh, Jane, uh, James Burke, and Cliff uh, Michael Moore uh, reporting on the Apollo 11 mission to the moon in 1969. Uh, and this was a, a BBC. So they actually covered that. And this was the actual show, an image of the show that was broadcast when they were covering that, uh, that particular mission. Nice. Um, yeah, unbelievable. So anyway, so it goes on and on. And I won't get into everything else because there is so much more to talk about with this guy in terms of his telescopes and what he used and what his philosophies were and all that. But he is such an important uh, figure in astronomy from yesterday and still is today, even though he hasn't been around in quite some time. So uh, that's just what I want to cover. Uh, how do I get out of this thing here? Stop sharing. 
That's what I want to cover on Sir Patrick Moore. And that's just not even the tip of a tip of an iceberg of what yeah. he has done. And so I think I'll, maybe later on, I'll cover some more of the stuff that he did. Because to me, he is just such an, um, such an important figure that people should know about if they don't know about him, you should study him because he's, and all of his videos are still on YouTube. You can watch them. And uh, if you want to watch the program, so it's, it's anyway, he's an nice. interesting guy. I got one question. One simple question. Yeah. What's with the British people in this hair? Like Boris Johnson's <laughs> hair, his hair, like they don't sell combs. You know what it is? It's always <laughs> raining over there. So they've always got curly hair. Right? Foggy. It's all fog. Just a simple question. I don't know. <laughs> fascinating. fascinating. Thanks, Paul. Fascinating man. Yeah. yeah. He would have quite the stories, I presume. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, geez. So, yeah, so when you're going through the catalogs, the Caldwell catalog, that's uh, it is, yeah. the other Messier. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. The other Messier, that's right. Messier part two. Messier part two. I wonder if there's a Caldwell 40. <laughs> <laughs> it's even interesting to know where that name came from. Yeah, his, really. His grandfather's middle name. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try my talk, I guess. Um, and get the right screen to share, first of all. Let me get it up on the screen here, first of all. Don't know whether I'm going to have sound. Oh, yeah. Lisa uh, mentioned a magazine or a book. It was called uh, Bang, and it was the complete history of the universe. And Brian May you know, was actually in on that one with, uh, with oh, him. Right. Yeah. And who else? The author, Chris, Chris Linton. Chris Lintot, Lintot, I guess you have to say, pronounce it. I'll have to get check that one out because I haven't seen it. Okay, um, I think I got, where am I at here? I'm on screen number one. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to keep forgetting my guitar, I gotta bring it out. Yeah, I guess the movie between music going. Mm. The right screen here in a second, I think. It might be part of it. There he is. Do you want uh, that one? I want it though. Hang on. I'm sure from the beginning. Got them up on the other screen. So just a second. Stop sharing. I want the right screen. This should be it. Okay. Now I get them up. There. Okay. Yeah. Right. For me, for me, it's got to be this guy. Um, I guess because I became such a fan of astronomy when uh, the Cosmos series um, that he uh, that he produced with Andrewian, uh, his wife, who became his wife, I guess, later. Um, and I was hooked on that series uh, very early in, in my astronomy uh, love, I guess, of astronomy. So I'm going to just one more second here. I got to bring up my third screen. Here we are. OK, we'll talk a little bit about Carl Sagan. Uh, on the right hand side, you're going to see a little bit of a quotes that I've copied from uh, um, some of his best quotes that he gave anyway. Um, now, if there was one astronomer, I would say that inspired me more than any other it would have to be Carl Sagan. Uh, in his eloquent way of describing the universe in which we live, he was what many would call the, the uh, quote, great explainer. Uh, his explanations were delivered with confidence of an expert, for indeed he really was. Uh, his qualifications, accolades and, and day job leave you with no reason to question any of his authority on any matter. He delivered his explanations with precise language, his words carefully chosen to be rich and interesting, and yet clear and precise. He took the time to build his explanation carefully in easy to understand steps. Now, Carl Sagan uh, from 1934, November 9th, 1934 to December the 20th, 1996, was an American astronomer American, now listen to all this, American astronomer, planetary scientist, cosmologist, astrophysicist, astrobiologist, author, and a science communicator. What a resume. He's, wow. His best known scientific contribution is his research in, on the possibility of extraterrestrial life, including experimental demonstration of the production of amino acids from basic chemicals by radiation. Now Sagan assembled the first physical messages sent into space, the Pioneer plaque and the Voyager Golden Record universal messages that could potentially be understood by any extraterrestrial intelligence that might find them. 
Initially an assistant professor at, at Harvard, Sagan later moved to Cornell where he spent most of his career. He published more than 600 scientific papers and articles and was author, co-author, and or editor of more than 20 books. He wrote many popular science books, such as The Dragons of Eden, Rock is Brain, and The Pale Blue Dot. He also co-wrote and narrated the award-winning 1980 television series, Cosmos, A Personal Voyage, which became the most widely watched series in the history of American public television. I've watched it probably 100 times myself. Uh, Cosmos has been seen by at least 500 million people in 60 countries. Now, a book also called, called Cosmos was published to accompany the series. Sagan also wrote a science fiction novel published in 1985 called Contact, which became the basis for a 1997 film of the same name. Now, his papers comprising 595,000 items are archived in the Library of Congress. Sagan was a popular advocate of the skeptical scientific theory and the scientific method. He pioneered the field of exobiology and promoted the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, life, or a SETI. Uh, he spent most of his career as a professor of astronomy at Cornell University, where he directed the lab laboratory for planetary science uh, studies. Uh, Sagan and his works received numerous awards and honors, including the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal, the National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal, the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction for his book, The Dragons of Eden, and for Cosmos, A Personal Voyage, two Emmy Awards, the Peabody Award, and the Hugo Award. He married three times and had five children. After developing mild dysplasia, uh, Sagan died of pneumonia at the age of 62, really young, eh? on December the 20th, 1996. <clears throat> now, Carl believed that he got his sense of wonder from his father, who in his free time gave apples to the poor or helped soothe labor management tensions within New York's garment industry. Although awed by Carl's intellectual abilities, he took his son's inquisitiveness in stride and saw it as a part of his growing up. In his later years as a writer and scientist, Sagan would often draw on his childhood memories to illustrate scientific points. Now, Sagan described his parents' influences on his later thinking. Quote, my parents were not scientists. They knew almost nothing about science. But in introducing me simultaneously to skepticism and to wonder, they taught me the two uneasily cohabiting modes of thought that are central to the scientific method. I like his uh, quotes. We make our world significant by the courage of our questions and the depth of our answers. Carl Sagan's legacy, part of his legacy in the family portrait. We'll talk a little bit about this one. The Voyager 1's final photographic assignment was to capture family portraits of the sun and planets. In 1990, then Planetary Society president and Voyager imaging team member, Carl Sagan, had been working for a decade to get these pictures taken. Mission managers commanded it to look back toward home for a final time. It snapped a series of 60 images that were used to create the first, quote, family portrait of our solar system. Its cameras were pointed at a string of small colored dots clustered just to the right of the constellation of Orion. The spacecraft was then 32 degrees above the ecliptic and nearly 6 billion kilometers from home. Mars and Mercury were lost in the glare of the sun, while Pluto, then still considered a planet, was too faint to be visible, but it was Carl's influence that allowed us to see our solar system for the first time. Now, to commem commemorate the moment's 30th anniversary, NASA has digitally dusted off the image. The original image showed Earth as a tiny speck within a band of brightness caused by the spacecraft's instrument. The picture that would become known as the pale blue dot shows Earth with a, with a, within a scattered ray of sunlight. The Voyager 1 was so far away that from its vantage point, Earth was just a point of light about a pixel in size. Just 34 minutes later, according to NASA, the spacecraft's cameras were shut down so the probe could save power. Sagan's ability to convey his ideas allowed many people to understand the cosmos better, simultaneously emphasizing the value and worthiness of the human race and relative insignificance of the Earth in comparison to the universe. No one has ever explained space in all its bewildering glory as well as Sagan did. Sagan was the most famous scientist in America, 
actually the face of science itself. To me, he's been 77 list. That's my little bit about Carl. Um, I have a video here. I don't know whether it's going to play sound or not. You guys can let me know if sound does actually come out. And maybe you're not hearing it. I'm not sure. Are you hearing it now? I'm here. I'm here. Everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the boat of dust, suspended in a sign. The earth is a very small stage fast for me of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner, how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged. in our obscurity in all this vastness there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere save us the earth is the only world known so far of our life there is nowhere else at least in the near future to which our species could migrate is it yes settle like it or not, the moment this is where we fall. It's a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more plainly with one another, to observe. And that's uh that's pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing isn't it well yeah i think he uh he told the story well there and he always told the story well it was always very eloquent in, in how he spoke uh to me i don't think there was anybody that could match me so patrick moore was incredible uh i think when i look at carl sagan he put it to poetry like he he was very poetic in the way he spoke um he hooked me at, at, at Cosmos. I mean, Cosmos is available. I know you can watch it on YouTube right now. Uh, it's called Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. And uh, was put out, you know, a number of years ago, but it's still a lot of the things that they, they talk about are still applied. Of course, it was, you know, just after the Voyager spacecraft when, when Cosmos was uh, was released. So all the things that we've done since then, web and everything have not been really involved in and. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of carried on the torch after that with, with his series of Cosmos personal perspective. So uh, I think I think that he probably influenced me more than any other uh, astronomer and to me. <clears throat> well, there, there were two, the two that we're talking about tonight were very, very different, even mm -hmm. in their background. 
Um, you know, whereas Carl Sagan was a professional in every way. Yeah. Yeah. And, right. and where Patrick, Sir Patrick Moore was a teacher and, and a professional in his own right, but not a professional astronomer, certainly not an astrophysicist or anything like that. Right. But he was able to keep going for 55 years based on his um, appreciation mm -hmm. for what was out there. And a totally different speaker. If you listen to Carl Sagan and then you listen to Sir Patrick Moore, you almost have to be European or English to really to really get what he's saying, because a lot of things that he says will have the, the type of language that's from over there. So that would be another separation from Sagan to him and from our perspective. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, but anyway, but very two very important people. Yeah, very much so, both. Of them. Yeah. Okay, I think we covered that. Uh, we have another there. important person coming up here. Oh, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> That's the right. Modern astronomer. <laughs> your next topic, right after, uh, right after, right after Stefan does his little bit of a talk, and uh, Stefan, I'm going to introduce you next, I guess. Sure. Um, Stefan is, of course, the uh, the. Uh, Developer and producer and owner of uh, Cliff Alley Astronomy. Uh, it's a, uh, a company that is uh, reaching out into the astrotourism uh, venture right now very heavily. Uh, Stefan offers uh, private star parties. That's how we started out, but it's gotten much bigger than just private star parties uh, yeah. as, of, as of late anyway. Um, yeah. And Stefan is offering actually another thing called the Sky Experience 2024, which he's going to talk about a bit too. So Stefan, I'm going to hand it over to you now. For sure. I'm just going to quickly uh, present my uh, screen because everything's on my website, right? So uh, it will just be two quick seconds. And if you can let me know if you see my screen. You're up and running. You're up. Yeah. Yep. So uh, if you go, by, we're really March. This, this March was really important. Uh, earlier this month, we uh, launched um, the Dark Sky Destination Network. And I've started with five partners where uh we got four in new brunswick and one in nova scotia and these are identified as great places and um rural coastal areas where you're away from the glare of urban lights so uh not only are they great accommodations that offer uh great activities or near uh, sightseeing during today the day you can also appreciate some great conditions if the weather cooperates, of course, uh, in the evenings. I've got five partners. We've been in touch with uh, uh, a few more who are considering joining. But uh, the first one we have is in Kokang, which is uh, uh, near Buktush, <clears throat> somewhere between Moncton or Shidiak and uh, Miramichi. And it's a waterfront property. It's a, uh, they call themselves glamping, but uh, they have a belt tent and it's very well done. And you'd be amazed at the, uh, experience you can have there and uh, they're seasonal their uh, season runs from uh, June to the end of uh, September uh, after that we got Deep Sky Eye Observatory our friend from uh, Quinton, Nova Scotia, Tim Doucette uh, he's got some pretty amazing uh, accommodations there the uh, sky bubbles are put up uh, for the summer months and those are pretty amazing he's got two uh, couples sky bubble, which are perfect for a couple's getaway. All the sky bubbles have a ceiling uh, window. So when you lay down, you got portal two almost conditions and you can see the night sky like amazing. Amazingly, they do have also a family uh, sky bubble. And Tim has a quite an impressive uh, observatory and he does a nocturnal theater on many evenings. So uh, totally worth doing the activity for sure. Uh, we have another partner here near uh, St. John uh, in uh, Gardner Creek. It's uh, when you make your way heading towards uh, St. Martin's along the coast. Uh, it's a beautiful spot. It's like uh, this modern slash Nordic spa of a blend of a place where you have in one building your your uh, your bedroom and sort of a sitting area and you got really great comfortable setting and right next door the building next door is where uh, you got a full kitchen and a four piece bathroom and all that but when you step out of the buildings you're facing towards the Bay of Fundy and you're facing southeast you're looking in the distance at a um, a rocky point called the 
split rock. And I think uh, we've seen some pictures on the show here of people taking pictures of the sunrise uh, at split rock and all that. There's a wood fired hot tub outside, a little sauna. So it's a perfect getaway and a lot of room and you're high above on the cliff above the water. So the conditions are really amazing there. Uh, I, it's probably one of the darkest uh, sites I've seen in the region uh, at night. Uh, and then we go to Alma, and we, we all know that uh, Fundy National Park is a uh, dark sky preserve. And uh, one of the popular uh, tourism operators in Alma is uh, Falcon Ridge Inn. They're right on top of the mountain overlooking the town, facing, as you can see in the picture, towards Nova Scotia. You're just minutes away from the uh, Fundy National Park for great conditions of, uh, for stargazing and all that. Uh, and really, uh, Bill and Susan are uh, amazing hosts too. So uh, I would recommend if you're planning on doing uh, Fundy National Park or go to the region, uh, definitely that's one of my top picks for sure, especially being a partner. And then one I'm very familiar with is in Doak Town, uh, Storytown Cottages. It's a, um, a campus of cottages and the main building that offers sort of like hotel suites or a kitchenette suites and uh, it's a huge private lot it's on the north side of the river all the cottages and the uh, uh, the buildings are sort of facing south so at night you see everything rising you're outside the town of Doak Town a little bit so it's quite dark and they have a huge field in front uh, uh, of the uh, property that goes down to the river if you go halfway down that field you have amazing 360 views all around. I know when I've gone there personally myself, I've always brought my camera and my telescope and uh, it's just amazing. And th these guys are open year round. So these are my partners. More will be added in the uh, coming weeks and we'll be excited to make those announcements. Some are seasonal, some are full uh, year round. Uh, they're booking up fast. There's already uh, somebody I was talking to that... Uh, was looking to book at in Alma for the Rask Star Party. And unfortunately, they are all booked up for that weekend. So uh, don't wait. The off-season deals are on right now for the ones that are open in the spring and in the fall. And they're fantastic deals. You can book through us on the website here, or you can book directly. Uh, for example, if you book a, a, a naturally, uh, if you book with Airbnb, if you decide to book through Cliff Valley Astronomy, you would save over $100 because you don't have to pay the Airbnb uh, service fee. And also they charge a cleaning fee. But through us, we don't have that uh, that cost. So, the, you know, there's opportunities. And uh, some of these partners, you can book directly, obviously, with them, too. So that's really our first dive into astrotourism. And then the really big dive is... Um, the event that we're going to do for the eclipse next year. Uh, we're coming back to uh, Dope Town for discussion. And uh, we've launched earlier this uh, this past week uh, the announcement of our retreat that we will be doing around the total solar eclipse that's going to visit us, visit us next April of 2024. Uh, so I've been working hard on building a unique uh, experience uh, that would provide a lot of value for people who would want to come to New Brunswick uh, because I think New Brunswick will be the best jurisdiction in all of Canada to, to experience uh, the total eclipse. Uh, and uh, because I was so familiar with Dope Down, uh, you can see the path of the eclipse here where you see my logo. That's where Dope Down is and that's where Story Town. So if you're a avid eclipse chaser, astronomer, uh, astrophotographer, and you want to have the best view of the total eclipse for the, either just viewing, taking a picture, taking a video, whatever, we are dead center there and we will be in the natural setting uh, in Doak Town where there's lots of wildlife, the eagles, the deer and all that. So you'll have also uh, the opportunity to experience how uh, the wildlife is going to react to it. Uh, we've all, also added a, uh, a second partner uh, for the accommodation, which is the Ledges Inn, which is also a very 
popular and renowned uh, tourism operator in Dope Town. So that gives great um, choices for if you like the style of being in the cottage or if you prefer being in more in the one building, sort of like in slash hotel feel, fields, uh, sorry, feel. Uh, then the Ledges Inn is also a great uh, a great place to be. And we uh, will have some various activities. We're providing all the meals. So it's turnkey. Your, your cost for your package includes your accommodations, fantastic food, all the activities. And really what really uh, started really feeling like it was falling into place was once we started approaching speakers and uh presenters and all that and i'll come back to these i was really excited to approach richard zarowski well-known meteorologist out of halifax uh, personal uh radio personality uh, he's currently on the uh, stingray uh radio uh, family stations uh, across the maritimes right now he was on rogers uh he's a he's a meteorologist but he's really a scientist uh you know, he's got an amazing, he's definitely an overachiever. Uh, he's right now still doing a doctorate and uh, really engaging and fascinating uh, science figure in our region. So he's well known. So he said, yes, he's all behind it. And then to my uh, second surprise was uh, I approached a uh, well-known uh, Trevor Jones uh, out of Ontario. He uh, started Astro Backyard. Uh, dot com. He's got a website. Uh, he's all. He's probably one of the best uh, known astrophotographers in Canada. Uh, he's been on YouTube for a few years. He's built quite the following. He's at over four hundred twenty-one thousand subscribers to his YouTube channel. And like me, he's a ast astropreneur. Uh, him and his wife started making a business of it. And uh, they develop content, they review equipment with manufacturers, and uh, they're uh, having a lot of success. Uh, and this is his wife, Ashley. Uh, she will be doing a presentation also. She's a big dark sky advocate. Uh, like me, she belongs to the IDA and uh, she's really passionate. So that's going to be really interesting to uh, hear what she has to say on the subject of uh, uh, preserving our nocturnal skies as much as possible. And then we have a uh, well-known to us here uh, on your show, Chris and Mike and, uh, and Paul, uh, Lisa and Rob Fanning out in New Jersey. They're, uh, as you know, uh, amateur astronomers and expert birders. So they're going to do a presentation on birding and take us on an excursion to see the, uh, uh, the flying, uh, wildlife if you will in dope town there's bald eagles there's countless types of birds it's a beautiful part of our province so uh, that'll be a fun uh, activity uh we've also added morning yoga classes just for paul i think paul would like that now <laughs> <laughs> and uh anyway so we're still building the agenda we're gonna have an amazing two days it starts on april 7th we'll conclude the on the 9th, uh, the eclipse is on the 8th. So that's going to take a chunk of the agenda on the 8th afternoon. Uh, I heard some people say, well, you know, is the weather going to cooperate? The thing with a total eclipse, even if it, you're clouded over, everything's going to get dark. Every Wildlife will react to it. Uh, we're going to have a contingency in case the weather doesn't cooperate that we could sort of have a live stream coming in, but still experience the darkness and being in nature and all that. So, uh, and you'll be surrounded with like-minded people. Uh, uh, we started selling, like I said, this week, we're already past the third way of uh, packages sold. Uh, we got uh, one kitchen that's sweet left at Dope Down amongst the four. Uh, we've got a commitment on, on half of one of the cottages. And at the Ledges Inn, we now have uh, seven rooms because I sold room three this morning. So it's moving fast. And, uh, you know, I, uh, we're, we're really trying hard to uh, create a exceptional, unique event that you'll remember for sure uh, on top of being, you know, one of a, a, a once in a lifetime event with the eclipse. And uh, we're hoping that uh, if, at the rate everything is going, we might have to add a third location to accommodate more people. 
but uh, we're very enthused and very happy to uh, with the way things are uh, progressing out of the gate. And uh, uh, we offer payment plans and there's going to be some sponsors being announced. So we're making this as feasible as possible. It is a little bit of an investment, but at the end of the day for the value that we're going to provide and the experience, it'll be well worth for a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity. Okay. So, so that's my spiel. I tried to keep it uh, short, Chris. So <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> uh, sounds awesome. Yeah. Yep. No You've uh, you made some real good headway on that for sure. As well. Yeah. This has been in the plans for a while. So uh, yeah, a lot of fun that's been given to it. Yeah. It's a fascinating event. It's going to be a fascinating event. Um, you know, if you stand on the earth, apparently one, uh, once in your lifetime, no, sorry. Uh, it won't even happen once in a while. It'd be every 375 years when an eclipse passes over your head. Yeah. So, and just to point out, the last total, years, okay. yeah, the last total solar eclipse that passed through uh, New Brunswick was in uh, 1970, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they only pass a short portion of the Acadian Peninsula. Yeah. So quite a bit of the province missed it then. So this is definitely more than one in a century or plus more years uh, yeah. of an opportunity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Let me Great. stop. Good, good stuff. You're doing, uh, you're moving it right along. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Good really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and one last thing. I'm also, uh, was the interview subject for uh, the Night Sky Tourists uh, podcast, uh, which is a lovely lady, uh, Vicki Durson out of uh, Arizona. And uh, she stumbled across me. She thought it was pretty fascinating. So she interviewed me a couple of weeks ago. That podcast will be going live Tuesday. And uh, again, I'm just excited to bring New Brunswick to the rest of the world because we have some really neat uh, assets here from an astrotourism standpoint. No doubt you're doing your part, sir. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Great job. Good luck, sir, for the rest of it. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you'll do. It's going to be an amazing event for sure. We're all looking forward to it. Okay. Um, our, th our third monitor astronomer. <laughs> 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 Mr. Mike is going to introduce our, our next astronomer on the uh, tablet. Bino Bud. <laughs> Hopefully coming up here. <laughs> Sir Patrick Moore. Carl Sagan. And final bud. And final bud. <laughs> what can I say? I'm right up there in the big leagues with this guy. All righty. Well, you'll, you'll all recognize this one, but it's, you know, it's been a full 365 days that we've gone in a circle and now he's back. So binocular target of the week this week by Bino Bud is the smiley face. <laughs> and it looks like that. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, comes across as a big pentagon rising in the northeast sky with the bright star Capella in the top corner. After roughly estimating where the center of the pentagon is, scan the area below and to the right of this central point with binoculars. Very quickly, an arc of seven bright stars came into view looking just like a big smile. And above it are actually two eyes. Now, how do I find it in the sky? Well, if you're outside tonight and it was starting to clear, but I don't know if it's clear yet, but at 10 o'clock, Oriented yourself at 220 degrees west southwest, pretty much look straight up. You're going to find Auriga. There's that Pentagon, it kind of looks like baseball plate. And then the bright star Capella, you come down about two thirds through, and the smiley face is right in this area, right in here, very close to the uh, the fish that we talked about the other day, because there's the the jumping fish. Well, guess what? M36 and M38 are right together, and here's a smiley face right in here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five stars that make up the big smile, and then two eyes right in there. What will you see? Well, look at this, roughly. This is almost what you're going to see in a pair of binoculars. And if you look, get it in the right spot, M38 almost looks like a mole on the side of a cheek. So there <laughs> you go. In a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, this is exactly your view. So there's the two eyes, the big smiley mouth, and like I said, M38 makes a nice little mole on the cheek. Compared to the full moon, easily, easily, two full moons, if not two and a half, maybe three full moons. So it's a very easy object to spot. And when you get up in that area, you'll know it. The leaping minnow, that's what I was talking about, is right here off to the side. 
And the smiley face is actually part of the splash that the Leaping Minnow goes into. So not only are you going to get a smiley face, but you can eat the Leaping Minnow as well. <laughs> Watch the lunar eclipse, I said. It'll be amazing, they said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you wonder. <laughs> this, was, this slide was already done before your speech, so it wasn't that <laughs> <chiming. laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's been our entire <laughs> week, our final bud. <laughs> that's no reflection on April the eighth. Let's get no, 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 no reflection at all. You're <laughs> <laughs> indeed clear sky. Summer, summer, hopefully here. Ninety nine point nine percent chance here. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Keep our fingers crossed. There you go. That's the other professional astronomer, Bino Bud. Bino Bud. What do you remember? Okay. And he uh, comes with air. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay. Um, we're running uh, 9.03, but I guess we're going to, well, we're about 10 minutes late starting, so we'll continue. Uh, Paul? Yeah. Rosanna? Yeah. Okay. Let's move. So if everybody's okay, we'll continue on with the show a little bit longer. Okay. So let me just share my screen. Share my screen. And this is going to be this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Yay. Yay. <laughs> well, welcome back, Rosanna, for another amazing fun fact. And uh, we read this one today, and I, this is this is a really, really, as they all are, very cool fun fact. So let's get right into it. So, Rosanna writes, hi, Paul. Back in 2021, the signatures of the ghost particles, neutrinos, were tentatively spotted in the Large Hadron Collider. Just this past week on March the 19th, physicists presented new results that neutrinos had actually been seen at the 57th uh, Reconters de Morand Electroweak Interactions and Unified Theoriums Conference in Italy. Now, let me show you that T-shirt. <laughs> you think you 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 think I'm struggling? You read it. <laughs> so back. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, that's what that is. Wow, the conference souvenir T-shirt would be something to see, and no easy acronym either. <laughs> that is unbelievable. The word. Wow. The word seen is inaccurate, so as no one has actually seen the neutrino, just the evidence of it, but, it, uh, but I guess it could look like this, and this is an artist's interpretation. The tiny particles were spotted by the phasar neutrino detector at the Large uh, Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland. To catch the subatomic uh, specters, the physicists built a particle detecting s'mores, uh, dense metal plates of lead and tungsten sandwiching multiple layers of light detecting gunk called emulsion. Now, when high powered beams of protons smash together inside this L8C, they produce a shower of bipodic particles, a small fraction of neutrinos that entered the s'more. The and the neutrinos from the from those um, from these collisions then slam into an atomic nuclei, nuclei in the dense metal plates and decay into other particles. The emulsion layers work in a similar way to old-fashioned photographic film, reacting with neutrino byproducts to imprint the traced outlines of the particles as they zip through them. Amazingly, the the whole 43 pages of the presentation are online, available to all. I confess I did not understand the math or the equations. So, um, so one might ask, why is this significant? We've known about neutrinos for some time. The neutrinos discovered by phaser are not solar neutrinos. They are neutrinos that they created from smash ups. The study of these neutrinos uh, the creation and the tracing of the scientists believe will eventually lead to understanding um, the how and the why of stars exploding. So that's why they want to really look at these, look at these things. The heart of a nearby spiral galaxy, NGC 1068, 
Researchers have found a thriving factory of neutrinos. Researchers do not know why this massive amount of neutrinos are being released, yet another mystery to solve. So every second, about 100 billion neutrinos pass through each square centimeter of your body. Let me read that again. Every second, about 100 billion neutrinos pass through each square centimeter of their body. The tiny particles are everywhere, produced in the nuclear fire of stars in enormous supernova explosions by cosmic rays and radioactive decay and in particle accelerators and nuclear reactors on Earth. In fact, neutrinos which were first discovered zipping out of uh, a nuclear reactor in 1956 are second only to photons as the most abundant subatomic particles in the universe. Now here is another uh, question researchers are asking. Could gamma rays and high energy neutrinos come from the same intergalactic sources? Not surprisingly, but in an effort to answer this and so many other questions concerning neutrinos, China is in the process of building a detector deep beneath the ocean surface to hunt for the elusive subatomic sub particle. Although every second tens of trillions of neutrinos stream through Earth without interacting with anything, occasionally one of these neutrally, neutrally charged particles will collide with a stray atom's nucleus emitting a nearly undetectable spark of light. This spark of light helps scientists determine not only the neutrino was there, but also identify where it might be or where it might have originated. This is absolutely amazing as even the decaying uh, potassium with a banana can create neutrinos. So did the latest neutrino come from a banana or a black hole? That's a bit mind blowing when you think about it. It rather makes all of China's alleged TikTok tracking of keystrokes fade into the background. Scientists have had to build neutrino detectors in areas with large amount of transparent materials in order to be a better spot unpredictable flashes of light that reveal a neutrino. Existing detectors include the National Science Foundation Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory in Antarctica, which covers around 0.2 cubic miles or one cubic kilometer with 5,160 sensors nearly a mile under the ice. Down there, the ice is clear enough that the sensors can pick up any tiny flashes of light. I love this picture of the Icy Cube Observatory. Now, I don't know if you can see that or not. Yes, you can, there it is. The Ice Cube Lake at the South Pole lit up by star trails is the photo taken in July 2015, and the image credit goes to Ice Cube Collaboration. China's new detector will be built with 55,000 sensors sub, uh, suspended 0.6 miles or one kilometer beneath the ocean's surface, and the sun rays can't travel that deep, which will help the sensors detect neutrinos and distinguish them from solar neutrinos. This will not only un, uh, this will not be the only underwater detector. Russia is building the uh, Bakel Gigaton volume detector in Siberia's Lake Bakel, uh, the world's deepest lake. So then there's the upcoming European Cubic Kilometer Neutrino Telescope. I'll say that again. Then there's the upcoming European Cubic Kilometer Neutrino Telescope, a multi-institution uh, collaboration that will hunt for neutrinos in the Mediterranean. Uh, there's also a Pacific Ocean Neutrino Experiment, another multiple multi-institutional collaboration working on a detector in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of British Columbia, Canada. So, a bit of international race is on and to find the track neutrinos. So these two are sitting there and she's reading the paper. She says, well, a hundred million neutrinos are traveling through our bodies right now. And you're worried about TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is just too funny. <laughs> and let me see if I can get back to that. And that was this week's... <laughs> Rosanna's Fun Fact. Yay! Yay. Yay. Oh. Hey. 
neutrinos, neutrinos, neutrinos. That's really? the oh, what they're what they're thinking is they're connecting that with star explosions. So look at the the vastness and the size of those two things. They, I was reading uh, recently that uh, with uh, Betelgeuse, you know, the fact that it's going to be going supernova at some time. You say, well, when is it going to go supernova? We don't know. Well, one of the things that they're going to be looking at is neutrinos. Uh, the increase in neutrinos will give them a sign that it's actually happening. I know we just a, a year or so ago, they talked about, they thought that it was happening because they saw Betelgeuse dimming and brightening and dimming and brightening. And there's more, what they believe now was that it was off gas and was giving away material in space. And from our point of view, looking at uh, Betelgeuse, we were losing our view and then gaining it again. And mm -hmm. so it was pulsating, basically releasing large amounts of, of material, but it wasn't increasing the amount of neutrinos, neutrinos, you know, apparently. So that's what we're going to be watching for when we see, um, you know, the the ultimate demise of Orion of uh, Betelgeuse. Uh, yeah, so they're they're fascinating things. Hundred billion of them in every centimeter was it? Every square centimeter. Hundred billion pass through your body. Unbelievable. So they have to. They have, they, to, have to, they have to collide with something in order to spark. So they have to have the detectors below ground or below below. Oh, the, it's got to be in, in because it's such a small bit of light. Mm -hmm. It has to be. Virtually dark. Yeah. Yeah. Can them with photons. Ooh. Hey, Mike, photons. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about them earlier. <laughs> hey, pretty cool. Thanks. Thank you, Rosanna, for another interesting yes, talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Topic. Awesome. Okay. Let's go from there then to uh, to a quick what's up talk. What's up talk? What's up? Uh, Okay, we should be up here soon. Right now we're going to go through this pretty quickly because we get some photos to go, and then uh, and then quickly through uh, our closing. Okay, uh, what's up this week? Um, let's take a look. Uh, well, a week long Saturn returns actually uh, after reaching superior conjunction on the on February sixteenth when it was behind the sun from our point of view. The ring beauty Saturn makes it another appearance now. This time in our early morning sky about an hour before sunrise. Now, by mid-July, it rises at about 11 p.m. Atlantic time. and It doesn't reach its best viewing or opposition until August the 27th. So we'll have lots of summertime viewing of the planet and its amazing rings. And well into the fall as well. So hooray for Saturn. We all love Saturn. One of the, one of the, wow, one of the wow elements at the telescope, for sure. The eyepiece. Uh, Monday, March 27th, uh, the conjunction of Jupiter and Mercury. Now, planetary conjunction occurs when two or more planets appear close to each other in the sky. Such proximity of planets is an optical illusion. Of course, in reality, they are very far away from each other, Jupiter and Mercury, for example. From an astronomical point of view, a conjunction happens when celestial objects share the same right ascension or, eclip or ecliptic long longitude in the sky. On March the 28th at uh, 4.30, 3 GMT, uh, Mercury will pass within one degree and 16 arc seconds of Jupiter as they meet in the constellation of Pisces. Mercury with a magnitude of minus 1.5 will shine brightly alongside Jupiter at magnitude of minus 2.0. Uh, both planets will be visible to the naked eye right after sunset, but you'll have to observe within a short time after sunset as it will close in uh, on the western horizon very quickly. So uh, nice view. Um, Mercury should start to, Mercury will be climbing in our evening sky. Actually, Jupiter is going to get uh, settling close to the horizon, closer and closer every day now uh, as it disappears for a little while. On Tuesday, uh, our moon near Mars. Uh, look to the southwest on Tuesday evening to find a waxing crescent moon, Greek Mars and Taurus. Uh, the moon and Mars will be will appear just three degrees apart, easily visible together in the field of view of 10 by 50 binoculars. Uh, Mars has been hanging around in Taurus for quite a while now and continues to form a beautiful triangle of sorts with the red giant star Aldebaran and uh, an Intorus along with uh, the other red giant star Betelgeuse and Orion. So keep an eye out for that. On Wednesday, March 29th, our moon is at first quarter. It reaches a third quarter, or first should be first quarter phase, not third quarter phase. On Wednesday evening at exactly 11.32 p.m., the first quarter moon phase is a perfect time to study our celestial neighbor. Enjoy the moon at any phase, really, with a, just a pair of binoculars. You'll be amazed at the features you can see, including the large maria, which are these large dark patches that we see on the moon here. Um, many of the larger craters and even mountain ranges like the famous Apennines right here. 
on Wednesday, March 29th as well, and even Thursday, March 30th. Mars will be near Messier 35 or M35. Um, look towards Mars for a view of the red planet as it greets the beautiful star cluster in Messier 35. Messier 35 or M35 is a relatively a close open star cluster scattered over a patch of sky in Gemini about the size of the full moon. Now, the cluster cons consists of several hundred stars. Always pretty in binoculars for sure, mm -hmm. for a small scope. Uh, also Thursday, the lunar straight wall. A Thursday evening also presents us with an opportunity to observe Rupus Recta, the lunar straight wall, roughly on a vertical center line of the moon's face, about one third of the way up from the southern pole. It is easily seen with small telescopes when the lighting is just right. And here, lighting is very important indeed. When the sun is at the right angle, the straight wall becomes quite obvious, almost looks like a cliff. One day after the first quarter moon, the rising sun makes, uh, makes it cast a dark shadow to the west giving the impression it must be a massive high cliff. As the moon reaches its last quarter phase, though, the sunlight illuminates the straight wall from the other side, causing it to appear bright. Now, the reason for this difference is, in appearance is that the straight wall isn't a wall at all, or a cliff, it's actually just a slope, about 110 kilometers long and about two to three kilometers wide. Just another trip of light and shadows on the moon, which happens quite often, especially around the line we call the Terminator. On uh, Friday evening, uh, Venus and Uranus. Uh, the planet Uranus can be a difficult planet to spot naked eye, but it is visible with binoculars if you know exactly where to look. Uh, this week on Friday evening, brilliant Venus provides us with a nice guide. We'll look to the south of Venus on Friday evening to spot Uranus. Now it will be just two degrees or the width of two pinky fingers below Venus. Both will be, fit easily in a set of 10 by 50 binoculars again. Uh, to me, the distant planet appears as a soft green disc. To others, it's more bluish in color. The Uranus is over 20 times farther from the sun than Earth is. So it's nice to be able to catch it when you can. Um, next Saturday, next meeting of the St. John Astronomy Club. This next meeting of the St. John Astronomy Club takes place on Saturday, April 1st at 7 p.m. at the Rocket Park Interpretive Center, which is next to the Duck Pond at Lily Lake in St. John. Our meetings are always informal and also informative. Uh, all meetings are free and they're open to all members of the public. So come and join us. Um, this chart comes from heavensabove.com. Uh, this is the chart for the ISS, the International Space Station that uh, passes over our area quite regularly. Uh, this is the evening passes for the next week. Um, the ones that are in orange here are the ones that are fairly bright. Minus 2.3 is fairly bright. The ones with the red are the brightest ones passes. So we've got a nice uh, pass uh, actually tonight. There was one at 8.57. Um, then there's been a couple of, we've got a pass tomorrow night, a couple on uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday, Thursday, right through the week. So, and here's the typical one. This one is on um, the 29th, I believe, right here. A pass of March, March 28th. So, there's the pass of March 28th. So, if you've never seen it, it is uh, pretty interesting to watch. Uh, this one's going to go right through Cassiopeia, down through the handle of the Big Dipper. And you won't see quite all the way to the horizon, but it'll still be fairly bright. So, quite easy to spot. Um, I always refer to this chart. This is a mar chart from March. I'm waiting for the one from Lisa from April. I know it's coming pretty soon. She's going to send it right along. So uh, this is uh, at Lisa's lookup, Astronomy and More. She gives us this chart every month um, and it provides us with the event that's happening, the date of the event, um, the peak time for viewing it, and also your seeing tools, the naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. You can find Lisa's lookup at uh, Ruby Moonbeams on Astronomy, or, I'm sorry, on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. Thank you, Lisa. And finally, our uh, St. John Astronomy Club RASP NB calendar, which is put up by our veteran Kurt Nason, puts this calendar together for us every uh, every month. And this is actually a six week uh, calendar. And that uh, it lists all of the events that are happening throughout the week. Uh, so if anything that's uh, any of importance at all, it's going to be listed here in the week uh, in the weekly calendar. So that's what we see for uh, this week coming up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Yep. <laughs> That's the way it is. That's, yep. why, that's why we have Mike Guyver. He can just <laughs> all those myths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go quickly through some photos that were sent in. Um, give me a second here. Bring this over to where I want it. Again, I need a second to set things up. Yes. Play some music in the background, whatever you like. Yeah. 
Do, 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 do. Nah, 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 nah. Right. Always happens. Okay, I just need to get my notes going here now. Be all set. Okay, let's get started with, uh, I'll share my screen once more. I'm gonna share uh, one. There, you're up. There we go. Oh, yes, sir. Nice. What a sliver. Yeah, so uh, this one comes from Brad Craft. Uh, Brad says, hi, Chris. I was uh, sitting outside on one of the dome tents in St. Martin's on Wednesday evening. I was sure I missed the new moon in the trees, which sat quite high above the horizon. I started packing up all my gear and just happened to turn around and I in time to see the moon and Jupiter pop into view. There we go. Yes, so sir. 1.9%, 1.9% illuminated moon taken freehand with a T6i cannon and a 300 millimeter zoom lens with some post processing and dark to dark table. Okay, awesome. Well, Thanks, yeah. yeah. Nice stuff. Uh, here we're coming from Dwayne uh, Schwam. Uh, Dwayne says, Hi, Chris. Like many parts of Canada this evening, we had an outstanding Aurora show. That was the other night, of course. Um, he said, I could see Aurora 360 degrees, including at Zenith. I've certainly seen brighter aurora, but these were among the most active and in, in, in every direction. Uh, pretty spectacular. It's worth noting uh, in the second picture, he says you can see aurora and Orion. Not that one there, but I'm going to show you in a second. There's the big dipper. Look at that thing right there. Nice. I think it's maybe it's there. There it is. There you go. So you got Orion in your, in your southwestern part of the sky, and look at the aurora. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen uh, both in the same view. Uh, probably so, yeah. I was able to share this wonder with my son and several kids from the neighborhood. We invited out to view together. And this is from uh, Saskatchewan. Thanks, Dwayne. Beautiful oh. shots. Very nice. Yeah. Wow, awesome. Someday we'll get them here like that. Uh, Matthew Elliott sent this one of Orion. Nice capture, Matthew. Sure. Yeah, it's nice. Where is it? I'm not sure. I didn't say where. I just uh, sent it in on my page. I had posted the picture of Orion on my page, and then uh, this one was added later on with it. So that's oh, my nice shot. Nice shot, though. And this one came from uh, Erica James Hemsley. Uh, she said, it was a good night for pics. I got too cold and only got this one pic one shot on my Pixel 7 Pro. Still a good shot, though. There's Orion there again. Oh, I am Taurus. Yeah, and Taurus. Taurus. Nice, nicely done. Thanks, Eric. And uh, Carol Bean sent this one in. She said, here's a view we don't get to see from Canada. Orion, Sirius, and Canopus. Or Can Canopus? Or Canopus? I'm not sure what's pronounced. Yeah. Uh, never rises from the latitude of Canada. She said, I took this in Mexico. Very nice. Oh, nice. Thanks, Carol. Um, Kathy Shaw sent this one in the moon and Jupiter together. Wow. What oh, a nice. color of the sky. Yeah, yeah, beautiful sky. Thanks, Kathy. Um, this one comes from Jason Berry. He says family was reporting strong aurora in Bonavista, Newfoundland. Oh wow! Wow, very oh. nice. <laughs> I see Peter Vis was on. Hey, Peter. He says, "Comb your hair, guys." Peter's here from Toronto watching you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get these guys to behave at all, Peter. Thanks no. for joining us. <laughs> so we're all in that. I, I don't worry about that. <laughs> I don't worry about hair too much anymore. <laughs> uh, this one came from Clayton Carr, Sunrise from Saints Rest. Oh, uh, beautiful. Nice shot. Nice. Clayton. And here's another one he got from St. Martin's. Oh, oh nice. yeah. They have the beautiful, most beautiful sunrises down there. Yeah. Um, thanks, Clayton. Um, Kathy Adams. This one here of the sun. Yeah, getting active again when I come around the corner there. Yeah. Lots going on. That's yeah. the Aurora, eh? March 25th, 2048. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Look at that. Maybe hmm. she's fast forwarding a little bit. She's fast forwarding. Could be. Yeah. Like Glitch in the matrix. Let's <laughs> <laughs> ask her about that one. And uh, David Hoskins sent this one in the sun. Yes, sir. Yeah, sure. nice yeah that's nice. Yeah. Nice specular there. And Those things are huge. 
Eric, maybe. It just goes to show you with, between this picture and the last one how much the sun changes. Yeah. And how quickly it does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's 2048, too, so we're going to see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's the next solar cycle, I think. <laughs> I had to get a red giant for that time. I don't know. <laughs> um, Kathy takes some ribbon, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Joey Croswell sent this one in last week's Sunday Night Astronomy Show, Bundy, by Bino Buds, Target of the Week. Um, yeah. And yeah, 35 open cluster in Constellation Gemini. Gemini, yeah. That's that? a nice cluster, hey? Okay? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, Mars is going to be near, uh, near this week, too. So. Yeah, he did a real nice job on that. He said, image to use an Asker FRA 4000 or 400 with a 0.7 reducer at 280 millimeter, um, 8 by 30 second exposures stacked in ASI Air. And edited in Photoshop. There's a nice little tiny cluster right on the bottom. Right, right on the end of it, yeah. Yeah. An NGC. Uh, keep, I don't know what the number is, though. I keep forgetting. See the big cluster? Yep. yep. Right there in the bottom corner. Yeah, just, 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 no, no. Go back up, up. to the big cluster. Go back yep, up. Right up. Just slightly go to your right. Slightly. Oh, right there. Right there. Yeah. That's, That's it. it. Now zoom in. There's there a whole other cluster right there. Yes. Yeah. Light color cluster, yeah. Yeah, look like all the same color stars too. Yeah, it's beautiful. No, you captured it very well. well I did a, a great job. Yep, great job, Joey. Thanks for that. Uh, Mr. Powell, put this one in. Yes, sir. Mr. Powell from the moon or from the suns. Yes, as well. That's an old one, though. <laughs> Last time we had the sun. Twenty thirteen. Not that old again. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Paul Owen, like the birds oh. were being drawn in by the sun, he says. Yeah. There you go. There they go. They're all going up. Don't fly too close to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at the sun. <laughs> That's a nice shot, Paul. If you'd like to send in your photos, we love getting them, of course. Here, we can send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'd love to share them. So thanks for sending those in, everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, just need another second here, and I think we can get yes. to our closing. So I guess um, there, uh, kind of a bit longer show, but we've covered everything, I think, pretty nice. So we covered a lot of stuff. Hmm? We covered yeah. a lot of stuff. We were late, we were late starting to. Yeah, I'll put a queen size to a king size. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Close to tonight, when you uh, invite somebody over for a cup of tea, you don't chase them out after an hour, right? Absolutely. Right. No, not in the maritimes anyway. No, sir. Thanks again for all your support. Uh, a special thanks as well to Rosanna for her continued contributions to the program and to Peter Rissima for the music. Hey, hey Peter. Peter. Hey. Thanks, buddy. Uh, uh, also, a special thanks go out to Trudy, uh, of course, and all of you who continue to share our program for us. Um, if you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can find me at astronomybythebay.ca. Remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com, and we'd love to include them on our next broadcast. And please let your friends and family know as well that we will be back here next Sunday night at 8 p.m. on YouTube uh, to entertain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. I want to thank uh, Stefan for joining us again this evening as well. So thanks, Stefan. Thank Great you. Job. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on sir. your successes, Sister Stefan. It's uh, working well for you. Yeah. Thank you. So for now, then, from Stefan and Mike and Paul and myself, I wish you a safe week, everybody. Lots of clear skies. As we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes pointed up. Good night, everyone. Alrighty. And that's you.